Terrible Light video, take one. And stand by for slate. And that was slate. <clears throat> um, oh, I'm going to need some kind of nut driver. Fuck. All right, stand by. Um, I don't think I have... All right, um, let's actually do this. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Hi everybody, Scott here, and this video is going to be a little different, which is to say the same. Um, it's not the same for me, but this is sort of an homage to a YouTube celebrity. I don't know if you call him a celebrity, but a YouTube guy called BigClive.com. Now, the reason for this is that I've become a big fan of Big Clive recently. And he quite possibly saved me from future electrocution. And so in that vein, I'm making this video to thank him. And hence, I am hoping that imitation is the highest form of flattery and that he wouldn't just consider this to be ripping him off. But so that you don't think my motives are ill, I completely recommend you check out his, his channel right now. In fact, you could even stop watching this video with its terrible background noise of many servers and go watch his videos immediately and never watch mine. I don't want you to think that I'm trying to steal his audience or traffic. This will be the only video I make in the style of him. And so don't subscribe to me but subscribe to BigClive.com. This tool is not working terribly well for this task. I'll be back in a second. Shit, did I move the camera? Ah, fuck. Alright, whatever. I have a set of sockets somewhere, but I don't know where, so we'll have to make use with this ridiculous tool. Another advantage of watching Big Clive's videos as opposed to mine is that he has a much better accent than my American accent. In fact, uh, I don't mean this in a bad way, but his videos can put me to sleep. But I don't mean that they're boring or I don't like them. I just mean in the sense that he's very relaxing to listen to where I imagine I'm quite grating or something. I think this is perhaps cross-threaded because this isn't coming out easily at all. Um, in fact, I'm mangling the hell out of this bolt. 
And I don't think, strictly speaking, it's necessary to take the yoke off of this light. But I am going to be taking it to bits, as Clive would say. Again, much better in his accent than mine. I think when an American says taking it to bits, it just sounds dirty or pornographic somehow. Um, not that I have any problem with being an American. I quite like it. It's nice, I suppose. But uh, there are, I think, better accents out there. Um, at least more relaxing voices than mine. You know, Orson Welles or something. Um, anyway, I should have talked about this light, I suppose. This is a halogen light. Um, I usually don't use halogen. I usually use uh, CFLs or LEDs, depending on cost and wattage that I need. But this has a more focused beam than most of my lights. Um, unfortunately, a war warmer color temperature, too. And of course, it puts out a hell of a lot more heat and uses more electricity. But it's uh, highly desirable in certain situations. I got three of these light heads and three stands as a kit um, on eBay for, I think, uh, like $65. Um, they were actually a previous customer's return. And so I was a bit worried, but um, seemed to turn out okay. So here's the light head itself. Now, the reason I'm taking this apart and the reason I want to thank Big Clive is right here. You can see, I hope, that uh, the sheathing on this wire has split. And that's not because I stressed it out or pulled on it. I think it was just brittle from the heat or perhaps uh, the connector here actually crimped too tightly onto it and had broken it and uh, maybe it slipped down. Um, in fact, the, uh, the sheathing feels a little, not brittle, but a little uh, less flexible here than it does just farther down. So these, these lights get quite hot. Now I should point out that these were sold with 800 watt halogen bulbs. At 800 watts is a crazy amount of wattage for a fixture like this. It's a very small fixture. There's, I mean, it's metal at least, but there's not much in the way of, of airflow or heat dissipation. I mean, it has these uh, holes around the back, but let's face it with this reflector here. I mean, with this kind of cheap construction, I wouldn't trust it with the kind of heat 800 watts would put out. So the very first thing I did before even using these lights uh, was replace the bulbs with, uh, this has a 150 watt halogen bulb. They're pretty cheap uh, to replace at a Home Depot. And I got a couple of 250 watts also. Because also 800 watts is way brighter than I need for my purposes, uh, which is just some background spill lighting, um, nothing fancy. So um, ah, I should have gotten something to hold this bulb with. So just hold it with my shirt. Um, oils from your hands can cause those bulbs to shatter. Sometimes as Clive would again say quite violently, violently, I can't do his accent. I'm not even gonna try. It sounded like uh, Transylvanian or something, but uh, yeah, so generally don't touch light bulbs that get very hot with uh, your bare hands. This is interesting. It has one Phillips only screw and then um, two of these sort of split screws that can take either a Phillips driver or a flathead. I did not anticipate that one extra screw. So let me get a flathead driver. Be right back again. And now besides that tear in the wire that I showed you, that watching Big Clive's videos caused me to investigate this light a little bit. And that uh, this is, of course, just cheap Chinese construction, the type of which he covers all the time, although he rarely does um, halogen or any kind of incandescence. But uh, I lost my train of thought. Um, but he inspired me to actually take a multimeter, a continuity tester to this light to see if it was, as he would say, earthed. 
or as I would say, grounded. And it turns out that, I mean, this is a grounded um, fixture, or at least a grounded cord, and it turns out that the fixture is in fact bonded to the ground wire, which is a good thing. However, and this is a big however, um, uh, these screws, they don't come, they're not, uh, are they captive? They're not coming out any farther than that. I doubt, oh, they have nuts on the back of them. I did not realize they were just spinning freely. All right, fortunately, they're really accessible to the finger, so should be able to, yep, there it goes. So as it turns out, and, uh, oh, I suppose I should show this to you. Um, I will get my meter. Not a very good meter, but I've had it since I was a teenager and it seems to be pretty accurate. Uh, put it to continuity and yes, okay. So from the ground pin, and of course, again, you can see we have got continuity here to the inside of the fixture. You can see, or here, I'll well, see in here, I suppose, that there's continuity if I have a good connection. And that's an excellent thing. I just wonder if uh, by any chance it's bonded to the neutral for no reason at all. No, it's not. Okay, excellent. That is a good thing. But here's the problem. And, and I'll show this when I take it apart, but this, um, this connector actually impinges on the sheathing of the cable, which as I said, I think might be how that, uh, how that breach occurred. So if that's impinging upon the cable and with all this heat that's involved, it actually, especially if I was, if I was using the 800 watt bulbs, if the metal from this were to impinge on that cable, then this metal could become live. And of course the entire metal case could become live as could the light stand that's then attached to the metal yoke. And that would be very dangerous. Um, but of course it's not dangerous if it's earthed or grounded, I'm mean, still in Clive mode. Um, because it would just trip the breaker. And this actually has a fuse in this box right here, uh, fuses under there. And also I generally plug my lights into a power strip, which has a circuit breaker in it. And then of course it's plugged into a branch circuit from my breaker panel, which has you know, a circuit breaker in it. So there's plenty of protection in case there's a dead short. But if this connector is not earthed, then, or grounded, shit, I keep talking like Big Clive, even though I'm not, um, then that would be a problem. And as you can see, there's no continuity to that uh, connector. And that's prob probably because the uh, shell of this light is um, enameled or painted somehow. And that's probably insulating this connector from the middle of the light, and therefore it's insulating it from the ground plane. Now, so that sounds fine, because then even if this connector were to become live, the fixture in its entirety would not. Oh, but then it would still go to the ground. Um, And so let's see, and there is no continuity there to the ground plane. So, well, that's not a huge issue. This is a likely point of contact between a, the live conductor and the fixture itself, just because it impinges upon the, uh, the sheathing of the wire so much there. So this could become live right here. No circuit would trip. Everything would seem fine. The light would still light. But if I went to make an adjustment and I touched that while I was moving the light around, I would get quite a shock. So again, I have to thank uh, Clive for encouraging me to test my shitty Chinese lights. So not only am I opening this up to see what can be done about bonding that to ground, but I also want to see if can maybe replace it with a different um, with a different wire connector, um, maybe with some kind of strain relief. Maybe I will shrink wrap the uh, 
or heat we put heat shrink tubing around the wire where it enters that connector, at least to provide a little bit of extra clearance between the live conductor and the actual connector and the shell of the case. So let's see. Um, very, very simple, of course, because this is all line voltage. Um, there's no indicators or anything, so it looks like... Oh, that's... That's something I see uh, the Chinese do a lot, apparently, which is to use a green wire as uh, either live or neutral. I'm not sure which, but that's why we have a continuity tester. This would be the live pin, and let's see. Nope. All right, so brown is live and green is neutral. And then the actual grounding conductor is, uh, if you can see it, I'm not sure how well it's coming out there, is in the middle and that's yellow with a green stripe, which is a fine color choice, I suppose, for ground. It's just not quite right, especially with a uh, green neutral. But I suppose ultimately the neutral is connected to ground, um, and it is the grounded conductor. So, shit, of course, once again, I don't have the correct tools at hand. Oh, this bit actually fits in there. I thought it would require a smaller bit. Okay, so here we have this little... It feels like it might be ceramic. It's probably ceramic, and this is probably for... Uh, heat dissipation, or at least uh, to restrict heat transfer, because, of course, the bulb gets extremely hot, and the conductors coming out of the bulb get hot, and likewise the heat transfers to the little pins in here, which transfers to the wires. So I'm assuming that these wires here, the white wires, have a very high thermal tolerance, uh, whereas the feed wire obviously does not, because, like I said, I think it melted in the back there. Um, so this must be act as like a thermal break between the actual uh, wiring of the bulb and the wiring uh, coming into the fixture. And it looks like a very simple arrangement. It's just uh, looks like two terminal blocks sort of set in this ceramic or high temperature plastic or whatever it happens to be. Um, I think it's ceramic. And let's see how to get this wire off of here. Uh, now this I need the flathead for. Again, not quite the right size tool for the job. That shows uh, what I get for not being prepared. But it's doing the job just fine. As obviously quite a cheap fixture. I mean, the metal that uh, for this connector is pretty shitty aluminum, I'm guessing. Um, there we go. Yeah, you can see, in order to keep the cable in place, uh, it has this little pin right there. Inside this, uh, what, the, what the fuck is this called? The horseshoe thing. Anyway, you can see that impinges upon the... Uh, the sheathing on the cable quite a bit. I don't think that the cable... At first I thought maybe the cable had shipped like this and it was placed there and then at some point it got yanked and then the uh, cable connector landed there. But this rip is pretty straight and I don't see any evidence of the same kind of markings that's on the cable um, from this connector. So I think... And I don't recall, I would have noticed this uh, when I first unboxed these and uh, set them up. And I did notice it got worse over time pretty quickly, even though I wasn't putting much strain at all. Uh, there was no strain on this cable other than the weight of this box, which is extremely light, and the weight of the cable itself. So that really shouldn't have separated like that. Um, in fact, like I said, I have two more of these lights, and one of them already is developing a small fissure there, and the other one looks okay. So. I don't know why that happens. I'm guessing just because of the heat and because the way the light sits, that is, there is a, the cable naturally sort of at an angle there. So, yeah. Um, 
it looks like there's, there'll be enough room here if I just want to wrap this in some heat shrink tubing, um, maybe two layers so that this connector impinges on the heat shrink tubing and not on the cable. But that being said, it doesn't really look like that connector is getting that close to the conductors inside. Um, so it might be just fine, but something should be done about this because that's only going to get worse over time. Um, and this cable is a concern anyway because the cable, the light fixture gets very hot even with just a 150 watt bulb in it. And even uh, then the heat transfers quite readily to this and to the cable. So the cable gets a bit warm up here. Um, it's, it's, I'm trying to see what gauge this is. It looks like maybe 18 gauge cable. Which is, I mean, it's enough for 800 watts, but it's not what I would call uh, terribly robust. Anyhow, um, and oh, one other feature I guess I should have covered before I took this apart is that these are focusable. And I put focusable in quotes because they're really not very usable, but there's a, a handle on the back, and as you rotate this, it rotates this screw inside, which causes the entire um, bulb holder assembly to slide in and out. And it is not very cooperative. Um, as you can see, it's not, it's not as if it's a terribly smooth uh, interface there between the, the two metal pieces. And so it does get bound up fairly easily. Uh, in fact, right now it's bound up completely. And, and I'm afraid to, to turn it too hard because this knob feels like it's going to snap off because I could feel the knob moving even when the, uh, the spindle isn't moving. Spindle or just screw? Um, in fact, this looks like it might be bent a little bit, the screw inside. Well, at any rate, so when you turn that, this moves in and out, which, well, the and the reflector stays still, so that changes... That changes the... Uh, where the bulb is within the reflector. And it creates either a pattern that's uh, sort of um, circular with, an with a hole in the middle down to a fairly tight beam. It's not very regular. I mean, this reflector is obviously not of the highest quality construction and it's not quite regularly shaped. So the, uh, the spill pattern from the light's not very uh, even. But what do you expect for the money? This, these were incredibly cheap. Um, so yeah, uh, oh, while I was just messing around with it, this wire just popped right out of there. And it looks like this, it's stranded cable, but there's a, looks like a brass um, tube crimped onto the end of it. I'm not sure, I guess that improves the uh, connection between this and the ceramic block, uh, terminal block. That being said, this did just pop right out, so I don't really know how well it improved things. Uh, this one's fairly solidly in there. Uh, I will need a smaller screwdriver yet still to get this block out, so uh, I'll be back again. Ah, yes, the little screwdriver set. Um, let me get this out of the way, because I think I'm done testing electrical connections for now. And, of course, missing a screwdriver, as I always am. It's not really missing, it's just over next to a different project somewhere else. Uh, yep, same thing on that connector, and the live and neutral. Now, the live and neutral that are coming into the fixture are do, do not have that type of connector crimped onto them. Uh, you can see here's the uh, bonding terminal, which this screw right here held the ceramic block on, and the uh, bonding screw is behind that. Now, 
This is, of course, not very good because, as you can see, the area around this screw is painted or um, enameled or what have you. And on the inside, it's the same story. So even though this terminal was over this screw like that, um, it was being insulated from the case by the enamel. Now, I did get continuity uh, to the reflector assembly, but uh, there's a good chance if you have one of these fixtures that there might be no continuity between that grounding terminal and the fixture itself. So if you have a, anything like this, or any Chinese fixtures actually, follow Big Clive's advice and test continuity between ground and uh, all metal points on the whole fixture. Um, you might be surprised. That's... I mean, I guess the threads aren't enameled, and as long as the screw has continuity with the, um, with the terminal, it would get continuity to the fixture but it's it's kind of an iffy way to do it. There should be a lot more surface area uh, from the fixture con uh, contacting the screw. And also, this doesn't look like a very good bonding screw because it looks like it's coated, um, anodized, or something. Um, so I don't know how conductive the coating on this is. So there's a chance that this could be uh, not a very good connection at any rate. Uh, yeah, so... I guess I wouldn't be doing justice here to Big Clive if I didn't actually take this uh, box to bits. Although, this is going to be a lot less interesting than the things he takes apart because there's unlikely to be even the tiniest whiff of electronics in here. In fact, it's undoubtedly just going to be a lighted switch and a fuse with a couple of wires connecting them. And of course, this box is made of plastic, and these screws are well recessed. There's no metal parts uh, accessible, so this probably will not be bonded to ground. I mean, why would you bond a plastic case to ground anyway? But let's see what we got here. Yeah, um, in fact, the grounding wire is just uh, spliced together, and then it goes straight through. And, uh, oh, you know what? On this end of the cable, and it's probably because of the heat, um, I don't know if it's coming out properly on camera, but this end of the cable, this, uh, the insulation on this conductor looks quite blue. I mean, quite green. Uh, whoops, there goes the yoke. Um, but on this end of the cable, it looks quite blue. Now, blue is, of course, a completely acceptable color for a, uh, for a live conductor in the United States and probably elsewhere. So that's not actually a problem. Uh, I hope you can see the color difference. Uh, it, it might be subtle for the camera to pick up, but it's... Uh, I, don't, I think it's showing up, but it's, uh, it's very obvious uh, to my eye in this lighting that it looks green. And in fact, I have some green gaffer's tape right here, which is most certainly green. And hopefully you can tell it kind of blends into that pretty well. It's almost the same color of green. Um, Whereas on this end of the cable, it's quite obviously blue. So, uh, I retract my negative marks on them for using the wrong color conductor, uh, the wrong color insulation on their, um, live conductor. But that being said, they've, this wire right here is most definitely green. And it's actually live in this circuit because, uh, we have... The live conductor, or did I say that was the neutral? Ah, shit. I forgot which I said was which. So we'll bring the meter back out, and that would be the live conductor. And all right, brown is live, blue is neutral. Now, actually, in the States, I mean, I was going to say this about brown anyway, uh, blue is generally used as a live conductor after black then red I think blue is probably the third most common um, and that's quite odd I've just realized that they switched the uh, they switched the conductors yeah because they have brown coming in here connect to blue and then blue coming in here, which goes to the fuse connected to green, which then gets connected to brown. So this is all sorts of messed up anyway. It's completely inconsistent. I mean, 
that switch isn't wired weirdly internally, is it? I, I really don't see how it would be. Uh, let's see, it's on right now. And so I'm assuming we'll have no conductivity between these two and between those. Yes, yeah, so this is as expected. The switch terminals have continuity there and there. So they've just switched, yeah, switched colors in the middle of this box for no reason, which I guess isn't terrible because, I mean, of course, this isn't polarized in any way. I mean, you can put the bulb in this way or this way, and it doesn't matter one bit. But if you're working on the fixture, if you're going to modify it for your own purposes, um, it could be quite a surprise that you have uh, blue coming in this end as hopefully live. Now I've gotten confused because the colors are used in so many different ways. Um, let's hope the fuse is on the live side. It is. Okay, so they've done that right. So if you were to, let's say, take it apart and put a new uh, connector on this, or you were to hardwire this into some kind of junction box that you were using for, you know, your own purposes, you, I suppose if you needed it at first, you would realize what they've done. But unless you open this box, you could be very surprised and confused by the fact that blue is live when it comes in to this box, and it's neutral when it comes out if that makes sense. But at least they've uh, they maintained uh, grounding continuity. So yeah, um, pretty much what I expected. And fortunately, live is coming into the fuse, then going to the switch. Although this cable, as, uh, as again, Clive would say, is dubious. Um, it seems like a very thin gauge of wire. Again, this was sold with an 800 watt light, which at 120 volts is the better part of what seven amps so yeah uh seven amps going through what looks like maybe a 22 no probably a 20 gauge conductor i'm gonna take that apart and uh and see because that's troubling uh for 150 watts whatever and this this connector is just poorly soldered on you can see there's a lot of extra wire sticking up there um not enough that it could bend and short anything out, but if this one was also poorly soldered on, uh, you know, on the day it was made, which yours could be if you have one, these are one of my other two fixtures could be, um, and these were both uh, left quite proud of uh, the terminals, they could, in theory, contact each other and short out. Now, of course, the fuse, I guess, should protect you. Um, let's see what kind of fuse it is. It is a... Rated 250 volts, and it's 20 amps. 20 amps, 250 volts. Uh, looks like a pretty slow-blowing fuse. It's got a very thick element in there. Um, yeah, slow-blowing, not that great if you're uh, worried about this thing shorting to the outside of the case. But... Uh, acceptable I guess I mean unless they want this to act as a fusible link just in case this fuse fails um, and that's why they made it so thin that being said I, I wouldn't want just an open fusible link in here inside a plastic case but ah, whatever um, let me just dig into this here at least they put some heat shrink tubing around these connectors. Now, they haven't actually heat shrunk it. It looks like heat shrink tubing. It could just be some kind of vinyl tubing, but it's not actually um, shrunk onto there or adhered onto there in any way. It's just sort of friction fit on there. It's not even terribly much friction. I guess the top of the case being here keeps the wire bent and keeps it in place. Uh, yeah, so this wire is, and I don't have an accurate, or I don't have a set of calipers at all, but man, that wire is thin, um, extremely thin. It's actually got fairly thick insulation. Uh, let's see if I can get through this insulation without, there we go. Uh, I'm going to call that 22 or 20 gauge. Um, yeah, which I I would actually have to look up the ampacity rating for that to see if it should handle 800 watts at 120 volts. Uh, or even as low as 100 volts, because uh, you never know what kind of power you're getting. And as far as the other wires coming in here, 
Um, I guess I could. Uh, oh, this this wire is fairly visible. I would say that's probably 16 gauge. Um, in fact, it's probably printed on here. Although, if this is arbitrary cheap cable from China, they could be lying about the gauge on the sheath. Um, and if it's listed in millimeters, I'm going to have to actually look up the conversion. Uh, cable's rated 300, 500 volts. Blah, blah. And, ah. 0.75 millimeters squared. And it does not have a gauge, an American wire gauge number on here. Uh, so I will be right back again. Ah, shit. Move that quite badly. All right. Uh, I'm kind of hemmed in here. <laughs> okay. Uh, da -da. Actually, let me do it out off camera or whatever. We'll get in there in a second. Okay, now my first search I did was just, I want to see what the opacity rating of that cable is, um, that little cable is, if it's in fact, let's call it, let's give it the benefit of the doubt and call it 20 gauge. Uh, 20 gauge has an opacity rating for chassis wiring of 11 amps, which, okay, that would be sufficiently rated for an 800 watt fixture. Um, it just seems awfully close to me, uh, for just by comparison, uh, for power transmission, 20 gauge wire is only rated for 1.5 amps. And th these are by American standards. Um, of course they may be rated differently where you are. There's some measure of safety, uh, built into that. It's not like as soon as you put 11.1 amps through it in chassis wiring, it's going to burst into flames. And next, I'm going to look up uh, AWG metric converter. And there's a nice chart here. Let's hope that this is helpful. Uh, so, 0.75 millimeters squared is somewhere between 19 and 18 gauge. So call it uh, 18.5 gauge. And actually, now that I look at it, um, I notice that on the little cable whip going to the fixture, the lettering is embossed on the cable. And in the cable coming from the switch box to the plug, it's printed on there. It's the same specification of cable, um, same uh, conductor diameter, same voltage rating and the same manufacturer. Not that it really, I don't know why this really matters. So I'm just curious. Uh, Xiaohuang Nanyang. And... Kama Kerr, is that the... No, different manufacturers. Uh, Ninjio... Ah, shit, I can't even read that. Electric Company Limited? It's uh, a little hard to see. Anyway. So, yeah, not the, uh, not the most robust circuitry or electrical connections in the world, but I guess uh, not terrible. Apparently, this little tiny wire, if it is a uh, 22-ish gauge, it's, uh, or 20 gauge, it is appropriate for this application. Um, I just tend to, whenever I'm building a, a fixture or doing any kind of wiring at all, 
I always tend to go up at least a size or two from what I think I need, unless, you know, unless doing so would get really ridiculous. Um, you know, always better to put a 12 gauge wire on a, on a 15 amp circuit than the other way around. Um, in other words, plan for the worst and hope for the best. So, uh, yeah. I will, I guess, proceed to solder that cable back on because I'll leave it um, because I'm not running this anywhere near 800 watts anyway. Um, and definitely not running it near the maximum opacity. I shouldn't have cut these, I just realized, uh, because now I can't put it back on there. All right, well, no matter. Uh, heat up the soldering iron and I will re-solder that and as far as the cable clamp goes I'm not really sure um, I think heat shrink tubing would be in order for this uh, I don't just want to put it right over that breech I should really cut that back yeah I'll have to cut that back um, this always gets more complicated than it should be, or than you'll think it'll be. Oh, that reminds me, I got a new pair of wire strippers I want to try out. Um, not these, these are old. Um, these are actually meant for cutting Romex. They have this uh, great cutter here on the end for the sheathing where you just uh, put it in, twist it, and it just pulls right apart. It does not nick the uh, insulation on the conductors at all which can otherwise sometimes happen if you get a little careless and you're not a professional who does it 800 times a day. But it's actually also not that bad for this type of jacketed wire because it's, uh, it puts a little bit of a nick in it, but doesn't cut all the way through. And then hopefully I don't make an ass of myself. Uh, usually it just pulls right apart. Um, of course it depends on the thickness of the jacket or the sheathing or whatever I'm calling it right now. Um, ah, well, all credit due to the manufacturer, unless these cables are twisted inside, in which case I gotta slice this down with a knife. Or actually, it's a very short length here, we can just maybe nibble it. No, a, a knife would be the way to go. Ah. Now, I need a knife, heat gun. Ah, this is taking way too long. Okay, and I will get this uh, out of the way. Always put the screwdriver back in the case, otherwise it tends to go missing. And uh, as long as I'm in here, do I want to put a bit of, I guess just for consistency, I'll put a bit of heat shrink to me. This is my uh, Chinese or cheap box of Chinese heat shrink tubing, uh, which actually works out just fine. Fine. Uh, I think this size. I just want to go with this one. Yeah, that one's a little more snug, which I think uh, is better for the application. So we'll just take a bit of that. And now my phone is going off. Okay, that's unimportant. So I'll stick that on there. And 
All right. So, yeah, let's see. This is a relatively new soldering iron. Okay, well, that's fine. It's a Stahl Tools. Um, somewhere between a name brand and a cheap Chinese brand. Uh, I was tempted to buy a very cheap uh, soldering slash SMD re rework station from Amazon, but uh, I opted for this instead. I don't know if it'll be better than the alternatives. Let's put a little fresh solder on there. Nice blob, and then see if I can bend this down and over it so that it stays in place of its own accord. Maybe, yeah, and then I can just push it in with the solder tip. Maybe a little extra. Ah. Perhaps a bit too much, but it should be a good connection. Yes. Ah. Oh, no. <laughs> of course, my heat shrink is now shrunk. I should have waited for that to cool. Oh, a rookie mistake, but easily remedied if I just take the shrunken part off the end because I cut this little long anyway. That was lucky. Still look a bit foolish, but... Without cutting the wire, of course. That's always key. I uh, should be able to release this little piece of the end. We'll wait for that solder joint to fully cool, and then I will uh, do that all over again. All right. Um, and then this one, I'm not quite happy with that. Um, Let's just see. Let's pull that away while I apply heat. Ah, marvelous. Okay. And let's see what I can do here. Yeah, because there's, there's plenty of length in this uh, conductor to get in there, but they decided to mount it so proud anyway. Um, so I can probably just get away without stripping this and just clip the excess off. And then I will just tin the end of this. This has through holes. Um, you know, that's still hot before I make the same mistake as I did with this one. Let me, now this is cooled, sort of work this up and over. Come on. Come on. I mean, these, this heat shrink tubing around these connectors is not strictly speaking necessary i mean they're fairly well separated there's a the separator between the terminals here um so there's really not much that can go on so i guess i give the manufacturer credit for adding this little bit of extra protection i should have gone up one size in the tubing um because this is that now so i cut the cable a little shorter this is now just a little bit too stiff. Uh, uh, not quite the lovely looking result. I mean, there's still enough slack in this. It's not held absolutely taut. But anyway, um, there are through holes on this switch, but I guess if I use the through hole, then I won't be able to put heat shrink tubing around it. But it seems to fit so nicely in the through hole. The cable just seems more comfortable than having to go up and then over at this sharp angle. And it's then below the plane of this separator, or below the top of this separator, so that uh, it doesn't really need heat shrink tubing because what is that going to come into contact with? 
Uh, besides, that's the neutral, so it's actually, I mean, you know, the neutral is technically, as long as your building wiring is not all fucked up, is technically connected to ground. Um, it's not a grounding conductor, but it is a grounded conductor in uh, U.S. nomenclature. So, yeah, um, that requires quite a bit of solder, though. This is thin solder. Anyway, that should be quite a good connection. Yeah, so I'll forgo the heat shrink tubing on that one anyway, because as you can see, there's not really too much to go wrong at this connection point. Um, yeah. All right, I still don't like the size of this conductor. I feel like I should replace it, because I've talked about replacing it so much. But no, I'm going to leave it, because uh, I'm not going to open all of these units up to do that, and... If it's good for the chief goose, it's good for the ch rest of the gander. That's not that expression at all. I'm a bit tired. It's late here. Um, heat shrink gun takes a while to heat up. And we'll see if there's actually heat, heat shrink tubing that was provided by the manufacturer if it shrinks around the rest of these. Ah, it is. It is heat shrink tubing. But I guess they just didn't want to spend the extra time and heat shrink it. But at least by uh, shrinking it right now, that'll prevent it from moving around in the future. Because, uh, not that it really could, but like I said, I didn't like the fact that it was, uh, that it could just fall off that easily. Uh, with the heat shrink gun, the heat gun, Plugged in and just out of the way without touching the tip to anything meltable or flammable. All right, and back to the fixture end of this cable. So, cut this very carefully because I think, like I said, the conductors are twisted inside, which makes this hard to pull off. And then just get it started, and hopefully I can rip it the rest of the way. Ah, good enough. Now, they're not actually twisted, but they are pretty well molded in there. Um, yeah, let me use this. Uh, I actually don't know what that is. Um, it looks like cornstarch. It's probably not cornstarch, though. Anyway, uh, I really should put a new terminal lug on this, um, and I also should scrape off some of the enamel on the inside right there, so that it uh, it gets uh, an actual connection, a proper connection. Uh, that doesn't need to be fancy, I suppose. Although this is fairly thick enamel, and that's not really going through there. I guess I could get the Dremel out and really uh, grind it down. Um, although I don't feel like making that big of a mess right now. Uh, I'm not really in a workshop. I'm in my basement and I usually do the messier projects in my garage because especially ones that are going to generate dust, uh, you know, more dust than just this, uh, because servers do not like dust. And grinding enamel off of a metal can is probably going to create a reasonable amount of dust. So, And it's the middle of the night right now, so I'm not going to go into my garage and start grinding things. Uh, but I did want to try out my new wire strippers. Um, I don't even know if I'm still recording audio. It would be really cool if I am. And how's my battery on my wireless mic doing? It's quite good. Uh, did, uh, yep, I'm still recording audio, even 54 minutes into this. And uh, ooh, my receiver pack looks a little low. Let's hope it hangs in there till the end of this thing. Okay, so, uh, I 
This is a vice grip. I don't know the model or what it's called, but it's uh, quite a cool tool. Basically, you put the wire in between there and there, and these two um, armatures come down and grasp the wire. Uh, the one on the left grasps the wire, and the one on the right has just one tooth, which is fairly sharp, and that pulls the insulation off. Now, there's a million variations in um, single-handed sort of, I don't want to call it automatic because it's clearly manual, but in uh, self-adjusting wire strippers. Traditionally, I use, uh, I like these quite a bit uh, for building wire anyway, because they have a 12 and 14 gauge um, uh, cutting holes, whatever the, that's called. Uh, the word escapes me right now. But anyway, uh, it fits over supposedly a 12 gauge conductor or 14 gauge conductor perfectly. I actually use the 12 gauge hole to strip 14 gauge also because it lessens the chance of nicking the conductor because if you actually clamp down this completely, it will nick the conductor in each of those respective sizes. So it requires a little bit of finesse, but most wire strippers do. In fact, most of the time I use um, wire strippers that are just uh, similar to these except with the hole in the middle stripping the wire and I just manually sort of gauge where it should be and then pull it off and it is usually the fastest way to do it I just thought these vice grip uh, strippers were really cool but here's this one works on many other gauges quite nicely um, ignore these long strands that are coming out because those are from the vice grip which is uh, it's not actually very good news for the vice grip um, but yeah um, these, these are definitely not 14 gauge wires but their insulation is probably about the same, well, a little thinner than building wire, but it, uh, it just bites into them enough that they pull right off. And now, I thought it was the heat that turned this, this uh, cable green, but even though we're a little farther down now, it's still greener than the blue on the other end of it. Um, in fact, yeah, this is the correct uh, end. In fact, this blue of this cable is a lot bluer than this blue. So, yeah, um, what I do need is a terminal lug for the grounding wire. Um, I cut these a little longer, or I stripped it out a little longer than uh, what the manufacturer had. Um, these weren't really pulling on the ceramic. Uh, it wasn't really too close the way they had it, but I, I just wanted a little more leeway. A little more isn't always a good thing because sometimes that means the cable will be bent a little too much or it'll end up uh, touching the side of a hot case or I don't mean electrically hot, I mean temperature hot and uh, could otherwise be a problem. Um, but on this, there was this be plenty of leeway and it's, um, it's not like it's really going to get any closer to the case because it's passing right through a through hole, which is going to be the same temperature as the rest of the case anyway. So... I don't have a problem with that. It makes it a little easier to work with, uh, especially if I'm going to take it apart again later, which I might just to inspect it and make sure everything's holding up. Uh, particularly the, uh, the jacket on this uh, cable, because it doesn't seem to hold up well under thermal load. I mean, you can see it's discolored there. Um, that's not from anything I did. And this was, that's, could just be uh, abrasion from the, um, connector. No, actually the connector was there. This was inside. So it could just be abrasion from installation or something. But uh, yeah, I, uh, it could also be that it's breaking down because of the heat that's inside the, uh, the lighting fixture. Like I said, this was a another customer's return. I don't know why they returned it. It's in fine condition. Maybe they just didn't care for it uh, because it is cheaply made. It suits my purpose, but uh, who knows? They could have run this for 48 hours straight with uh, 800 watts bulbs in it, which I think would be stupid, but that could be what they did. Anyhow, um, I think I used up most of my previous strickle of solder. So I will tin these leads. Actually, you know what? I'm not going to tin these because they weren't tinned. And on screw terminals, uh, especially at line voltage, you should not tin leads. Um, I may solder the uh, the lug onto the grounding conductor, but uh, for that I need some lugs. Ah, shit. Ah, yes, cheap Chinese uh, 
connectors for a cheap Chinese light and a cheap Chinese crimper as well. Um, not the best, of course, but uh, not the worst. I wouldn't necessarily use any of these connectors. These are really flimsy aluminum. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily use these for any high voltage or line voltage applications, I should say. Um, they're great for electronics, for, you know, 12 volts, uh, 5 volt connections, what have you. I would be fine using these, um, but not a fan at line voltage. That being said, of course, this is the grounding conductor, which may have to pass line voltage in some sort of malfunction or emergency. So uh, I'm not quite proud of using these, but uh, it'll get the job done. Now what I am going to do is remove this uh, blue sheath on the connector because uh, this is of course grounding and I do want it to touch uh, the metal case. And also I'm going to solder this on because this real shitty brittle aluminum uh, does not crimp well. If you over crimp it even slightly, it'll just sort of deform too much and snap. Uh, maybe not right away, but maybe when you go to connect it to something. I discovered that when I was trying to rewire a battery pack for a trip light UPS. And uh, these things just kept uh, falling right off the cable because of course this crimp tool is not the best either. It's not really calibrated well, if at all. Um, you can see it's got uh, blue there to indicate the blue insulation on top of the uh, crimp uh, on top of the crimp ring but uh yeah it was hit or miss um and i was using it with the correct wire gauge so i'm going to crimp this lightly and then solder it um, and also i'm going to bend the cable around here in fact this lead i should tin first uh, da -da, da -da, da -da. And uh, ooh, my soldering iron is quite hot, but the handle is actually getting quite warm, which is a bit concerning. Come on. Another part where I'm not quite as good at Big Clive is really being dexterous with the solder and the components. I admit I usually use a pair of helping hands or something similar. Um, in fact, in one of my previous videos, I didn't even have a helping hands. I had had one at some point and lost it. And so I ended up just uh, I was doing a small circuit board and I just ended up taping it to the bench and taping it to all sorts of other things to hold it down while I... Uh, solder the components uh yeah and not my finest hour i love how clive can just hold the circuit board between you know like a violinist between just a few fingers and then use another couple of fingers to hold the solder and then a couple of fingers here for the iron a couple of fingers here for another component i mean it's it's quite cool the way he does it um yeah I'm quite a fan of that so I'm going to put, set that there, and because I uh, just want to crimp it lightly enough so that it gets uh, some contact, I'll use the actual blue one, which is meant to crimp it with the insulation in place. And that actually is holding it fairly firmly. Uh, double this back over, just for a better mechanical connection. And then, uh, I mean, that's actually pretty good. I don't know that I'd trust it forever, but... Uh, yeah, and then just feed some solder in there. Really build it up, I think, is good. Um, yeah, that should be good. See, this is the iron, and um, it's actually too hot to hold right here. Uh, well, almost too hot to hold. I mean, clearly I'm holding it. But um, it's very uncomfortable, the amount of heat that's right here on the... Uh, and that's actually the rubberized part that you're meant to hold on to. Um, this plastic cap that keeps the locks the um, the tip on is extremely hot. Ooh. And that's plastic. I mean, it's obviously high temperature plastic, but uh, 
I probably have the iron set too high. Um, soldering larger line voltage level components, uh, I usually use a higher heat than I would for electronics. Uh, I actually have it quite high right now, so I'm going to turn that down because uh, I had it at 550. But oddly, this soldering iron, which, as I said, is new. Um, actually, let me crank it up all the way. Uh, this is, I don't know why this is turning into a review of the soldering iron, but the soldering iron, I think, goes up to 800 degrees. And I had it, uh, 842 is the maximum setting. And I had it set to 550, and the actual um, shaft of it, the part you're supposed to hold, was getting really freaking hot. Uh, if I had to use this at extremely high temperatures, like 842 degrees, it might well burn my hands. I'm, I'm turning it down to, sorry for all the beeping and clicking, I'm turning it down to 450 from 550. Um, that should be, uh, that should be fine. Or actually, I think I'm done with the soldering, so I will just turn it off then. Alright, uh, this didn't come out as the neatest looking... Thing in the world but uh, it ain't going anywhere um, but it's got a lot of solder that wicked down into the connector um, in fact it's really packed in there top to bottom and since I had the soldering iron in such a high heat and uh, I definitely got a lot of heat into the connector itself that should be quite a solid joint for years to come uh, if this were to pull it would the cable would undoubtedly break or the wire would undoubtedly break uh, which I guess a stranded wire is a cable it's not a wire because it's multiple wires twisted together anyway uh but that's a bit pedantic i guess so uh i won't bore you with the putting the rest of this back together because it's exceedingly simple um so we'll just cut to it being done or actually no i'm not uh i'm not going to cut to it being done so i can turn off all the uh lights in this area and turn off the camera itself and just sort of let it cool down in here a bit. Um, even though I'm using compact fluorescents and LEDs to light this little area, I'm using quite a few of them because I tend to like overkill and uh, they still generate a reasonable amount of heat or at least those lights combined with the servers generate quite a bit of heat. Uh, and I'm not running the air conditioning yet because it is still early March and uh, yeah, there's no reason to spend the extra money on the electric bill. So, you saw what it was like when it was put together before. I'm just going to reverse that. And, uh, yeah, we'll cut to that. I mean, we won't cut to that. Actually, what we will cut to is putting the heat shrink tubing on this uh, cable. Now, I think uh, this tubing here, because this is a modification I'm doing rather than just putting it back the way it was. Now... Another reason that this might be desirable is because the inside of this uh, fitting is fairly sharp. I mean, it's not tremendously sharp, but it could gouge the uh, wire's jacket a little bit. Um, so I want to make sure the heat shrink tubing extends past that point inside, but also past the point of the connection on the outside. And it looks like this should be long enough because here's the piece I cut out. And as you can see, it reaches the inside and that's where the connector actually makes contact with the wire. So this tubing, sh this uh, heat shrink tubing should be long enough. The other thing I'm doing is I'm using red and black. Black will be on the outside, red on the inside. And I'm hoping the red's thick enough, actually. Let me just twist these out a little bit. The reason I'm doing this is so that if the heat shrink tubing starts becoming abraded and wearing down, um, first the black will get damaged and then the red. So if I start seeing red heat shrink tubing poking through the black, it should be pretty obvious. I'll know that uh, the black has been completely abraded away. Whereas if I were to just use entirely uh, black heat shrink tubing, you know, it would, be, it would be apparent if I look closely at it, because you'd see the layers. But uh, at least this way, it should make it a lot more obvious, so that I can sort of preemptively uh, solve any problems with it. So I'll leave it there a little bit shy of this end here, because uh, I want it, ideally I would use it for a little bit of strain relief too. I think it's uh, a little too short to provide any kind of reasonable strain relief. But, uh... 
yeah, and then this part is, of course, very straightforward. I love featuring tubing, though. I, uh, I don't see how you couldn't. It's just fun. And yeah, you don't want to overheat it because eventually it could over shrink and, uh, and split. That being said, you just want to make sure it's even. In fact, it looks like you could use a little extra shrinkage there. I jumped the gun a little bit. Ah, no pun intended. Um, and you don't want to, even though I just did it, I mean, this is at a low setting right now. And you don't want to leave the heat in one area for too long because that'll just probably overheat that one area and either split it or maybe even melt it. Um, if the heat shrink tubing has a higher thermal, uh, higher melting point and higher, you know, the point where it uh, actually shrinks too much and splits than the underlying cable, you could actually end up uh, theoretically melting the inside of the, melting this cable inside the heat shrink tubing um, with possible disastrous results if you overdo it with the heat. So just a light little bit of heat. Um, it's a little, it's almost too hot to touch right now, but not quite. Um, which is usually a good sign if, generally speaking, if your fingers can take the heat, then so can the, uh, the wiring of the components. I don't know if that's a real rule of thumb or not, or I'm just pulling that out of my ass, but uh, it sounds quite reasonable. Now, one thing I didn't check after, or right before this, I mean, it seemed like there would be, I didn't check to make sure that this heat shrink tubing would fit through this uh, connector, which, ah, shit. It looks like it fits through the first part, but then it becomes a slightly, ever so slightly smaller diameter. Um, like a few millimeters inside of the connector. Ah, one layer of heat shrink tubing would have passed through just fine. Two layers is too much. Ah, I just screwed myself over on that. It really looked like it would fit. I thought it would fit, but it's not going to fit. I mean, oh, wait, eh. wait, 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 did I speak too soon or am I completely just damaging this entire thing, which I just spent time trying to protect? Hmm. Actually, it's in there far enough, I believe. Yeah. Uh, the heat shrink tubing won't come out the very end, but the insulation, the jacket for the wire will. You can see there's just a little bit of black there. And as long as that is proud of, um, of the threading for the connector, then the conductors won't get abraded, and this should be fine. As long as it doesn't slip, but it's... Even without the connector on it, it's not pulling out very easily. So I think it's pretty good. Hmm. Yeah, apparently my heat... Oh, you know what happened? Yeah, that's interesting. The, uh... The red actually slipped, uh, this black uh, tubing actually slipped back, and the red actually made it all the way in, I think, or almost all the way in. Or a lot farther, anyway, because it's, uh, it's not even with the black heat shrink tubing anymore, which is actually good for strain relief. It's good if it's staggered a little bit. Um, not that it's staggered that much, but now I need to re-shrink the end there because it slipped. And, uh, yeah, otherwise I'm going to leave it like this, even though it's just a tad bit ghetto. Um, although it looks quite all right. I mean, it looks better than it did. It actually looks like it has some kind of strain relief, and it's, uh, I don't know, I think a little bit more professional in appearance on the outside. Uh, so, yeah, I'll put this uh, cable clamp back on. Now, of course, this is a lot thicker, so I won't be able to screw it down all the way, but I should be able to screw it down enough 
And incidentally, uh, and quite fortunately, because I wasn't paying much attention, the screws that held the reflector in around the uh, outside of the fixture are the same as the screws that held this cable clamp on, because I just kind of threw them all on the table. Um, yeah, but it looks like uh, all the screws that are on the table are identical. So, except of course for the grounding screw, or the bonding screw, or the whatever screw. All right, get that side started and get this side. One mistake that people make with these type of clamp connectors a lot is that they just go and tighten down one side completely down, you know, as far as it can go until metal touches metal and then go and try to tighten down the other side. And that could very well over tension, the over tighten the connector um, and put too much tension on the cable. Like, I don't think I'm going to screw this down all the way, even though it's intended to with the diameter of the uh, cable that's, that's usually coming into it. Now with the heat shrink tubing, it, uh, it's going to be a little bit wider, but that's fine with a clamp connector like this. These can accommodate different cable sizes. Um, and now, let's see, we've still got uh, some jacket sticking up, and I'm trying to pull this apart, and it's not budging. So I think that will be more than adequate. And at least now when the lamp is sort of sitting on an angle like this and the cable's weight is on it, you can see that's providing a tad of strain relief. Um, in addition, if this way, if this starts degrading a little bit, um, it won't, uh, it'll hopefully stay intact. Um, I guess time will tell. Anyway, that's it for now. Um, this will get put back together the same way it was earlier. And uh, other than a minor modification here, not much needed to be done. Um, I guess I could if I really wanted to, or I could have. I'm not going to do it now because I already soldered this in. I don't feel like redoing it. But I could have switched these two conductors uh, so that the colors match up um, just for consistency. But I know it's like that. You know it's like that. So uh, I guess that's fine. Anyway, thanks for watching. And uh, once again, uh, this was intended as an homage to BigClive.com. If you don't know his, uh, what he does on YouTube, check it out. Uh, I think if you just look up BigClive.com, all one word, if you put that in the search box, it should come up with plenty of his videos. I think he's got like 700 of them, and I have probably watched uh, 250 or 300 in the last uh, two weeks or so. I just just think about a uh, just think about a man taking things apart in a workshop that uh, I just like to watch.